Well, we're going to use the time. Uh, I want to thank you, Achim, for the generous introduction and the generous invitation to join you today. And also to the Institute for making it possible to present some of the thoughts, concepts, and a small amount of projects uh, gravitating around the issues of using artificial intelligence in architecture design. Um, so as Achim mentioned, I'm the co-founder of the Architecture Practice Span. And the lecture today is um, not necessarily about the whole body of work of SPAN that would take a, a while, but really focused on the research we have done on the use of artificial intelligence in architecture design. And um, it's all the, 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 the basis of the lecture is my book, Neural Architecture Design and Artificial Intelligence, which was published with ORO last year and basically collected the thoughts, ideas, concepts, and projects that we've done in this area for the last five, five-ish, six years or so. And it is, not a, it is not designed as a manual of how AI works or how the algorithms work or how the math behind it works, but rather discusses the cultural implications of using artificial intelligence in the context of AI. Like, what does it mean if, a, if we as a discipline have, for example, access to almost the entire history of architecture and are able to create learning systems that are able to inform designs based on the, that history? Um, it, it discusses... Um, aspects of estrangement, defamiliarization, um, aspects of linguistics within AI and how they actually tie into ideas of design and, and uh, also fabrication. So what do, I, what do I mean by neural architecture? I mean, neural architecture is the field of architecture that is primarily preoccupied using any form of neural network to uh, in their design processes. And we went through a whole series of experiments and ideas that basically were informed about how to build up data sets that can um, go into a particular direction of architecture. For example, here on the right side, those were uh, a data set of Piranesi, a data set of, uh, of brutalist buildings, et cetera, et cetera. And then to find how this can possibly inform an architectural design like the one you see on the left side. But before I go into details, let me ask like the most simple question, which is why to use AI at all? That's, I think, the first thing that you need to answer when you start to, to think about it in more, in more broader terms. And there is, this is more like, like the most, the, the, the quickest answer I can give, which is it's better to teach machines how to learn instead of how to do things. It's better to teach machines how to learn instead of how to do things. So what do I mean by that? I'm talking to experts here about what you're seeing here, which is in, uh, until the late 1960s, basically, building cars looked like this, right? You had um, experts who knew how to weld things together. They were on an assembly line. They put the pieces together and manually put them, uh, um, uh, weld them together. Uh, another one here, this is two examples. One is from Volkswagen. Sorry, I didn't find one from Mercedes. So this is one from Volkswagen, and the other one is from Ford. It was all very similar. But this started to change in 1967 with the introduction of the Unimate, which was the first robot that was used on an assembly line. And that was in New Jersey. Uh, and it was General Motors, as far as I remember, who used the first industrial robot um, on an assembly line. But today, it looks like this, right? You have like these long assembly lines with tons of robots. Uh, but this is all. Um, a system that is uh, still an expert system. Because as you all know, I'm, I'm, you, know all, you all have seen those pendants that are on the robots that allows you to literally train or teach a robot particular moves in space and particular points where to weld, for example. Now, every time you have to change the model of the car, you have to retrain the robots, which is, of course, very costly. It's very, uh, so it needs a lot of effort to get this done. It takes time. However, since the late 1960s to today, the car industry has collected probably billions of welding points, of points in space of where to weld. So actually you can take that data and instead of uh, training a robot to particularly weld one specific car model, you can actually train it to understand what it means to weld and what it means to weld well. Yeah? So what that means is that in combination with machine vision, you can have a robot that a car comes along, it's not trained to sp uh, specifically weld certain points, but it understands these points here at that car are good, to, are good welding points, and it does it. And the advantage of it is, of course, that every single car that comes along that line can be different. It doesn't matter for the robot. Yeah? And I know this is topics that you have been 
widely aware here in the Institute. So now let's go to another direction, which is, so we were talking about the practical application. Now let's talk about the, let's say the ar artistic or cultural application. The, uh, the book title and the lecture title, Neural Architecture, is basically borrowed from the arts and from music because fields like neural art and neural music already exist. So I borrowed that, as architects do, right, and, and appropriated it. And you've probably seen this painting before. Uh, this is the portrait of Bertrand de Bellamy by the Paris-based um, art collective Obvious, which made quite waves in 2018 because it sold for about half a million dollars at Christie's. And it is supposedly the first AI-generated artwork that uh, was done. I'm not sure if this is true. This is what the newspaper said. I think an art historian 20, 50 years from now will make that judgment, which one was the first one. But it's sold like that. And even the signature is actually a part of the mathematics that was used in the, in the painting. Now, this immediately opens some really important questions. Like, who's the author here? Yeah. Is the author the art collective that came up with the idea to use an algorithm to generate an image? Is it the programmer who actually made the algorithm and, and uh, the GitHub repository and everything for this here? Or is it the hundreds or maybe thousands of artists in the data set used to make this painting? So it's not, it's not an entirely clear, answerable question. But there's artists today who are really interested in understanding that this new field of artistic production can aid or enhance or amplify their message, their idea about art. Um, and this goes, as I said, it's not only uh, true for, uh, for uh, visual art, it's also true for music, it's also true for uh, literature and poetry. I think literature was literally one of the first fields who started to apply artificial intelligence in their production way back already in the uh, late 60s and early 70s. Yeah, so there's a history to this. Yeah? Um, but it also uh, it makes you understand once you start looking into this art that something is different, something is provocative to you. And sometimes it's collaborations, like in this case, the artist Mario Klingemann, a fantastic artist from Munich, was collaborating with a, with a band in Los Angeles called Yacht, who also create music using neural networks. Around the time when this painting came out, we also started to experiment with playing around with data sets and seeing what they can do for us. So this, for example, is obviously a data set based on Gothic imagery. Yeah? And uh, what we discovered using this, and at, th at that time, those systems were not perfect, which is good, because this imperfection is what created things that are really provocative and interesting for us. Yes, you recognize goth Gothic features, but they're somehow estranged and, and defamiliarized. So what does it mean, basically, when architects now enter an area where certain things like authorship, agency, and so on are not that clear anymore, when we're suddenly not on the tip of a pyramid of production uh, in terms of art or architecture, but rather where we are uh, entering a field, like a flat plateau, where you have several players at the same time, human and non-human. So this is why I also like to discuss this as a post-human design methodology. When I say post-human, I don't mean after humans, so humans are gone. What I mean is basically an area where the human dominance in certain areas are gone and we have different players playing at the same time on a field. So shortly after these first experiments with, uh, with the Gothic architecture data set, we thought, oh well, maybe we can also do something like that with sections and plans. So we collected thousands of plans, thousands of sections. Everyone, I don't know, <coughs> I guess you're common with the term scraping which is basically that you, aut you can automatically start downloading images from the internet uh, that are labeled in a specific way. So you, it's a short Python code, basically, that you can put in, and then it starts to just scrape the internet for every image it finds with that label. Uh, by the way, uh, talking about that, when I did the Gothic data set, yeah, the first thing I put as a search term for that scraping was goth. And you can imagine what I got out of that search. It was quite interesting. Uh, but it also showed me how, mu how much human effort it needs to make a good data set because we need to clean it up and it took ep forever to do that. But we started to do this with plants. And of course, architects would see that and recognize that, oh yes, it has plant features. Yeah? And I thought, oh, fantastic. Now I can start like automatizing sections and plants and everything in my projects. Pff, great. And then we started to look closer into them and we we're like, ah, okay. Yes, it can emulate something that looks like a plan, but most of them make no sense whatsoever. 
Yeah. So um, this is where again human ingenuity is 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 uh, is necessary to find something that informs your project in an into an interesting direction, but you still have to post process a lot of it to get to a project. I mentioned already think terms like estrangement and defamiliarization, and remember the images that we just saw before. Um, so estrangement and defamiliarization are concepts that, I mean, I think the first one who coined the term is actually Viktor Shlovsky in 1917 in his paper uh, Art is Technique. Uh, he was a Russian uh, formalist, and uh, other artists also picked up on that. So, for example, Bert Brecht used the same methodology in his plays uh, as, as something that evokes estrangement by um, adding abstraction to reality. Meaning, for example, when he had a play with Muta Courage, you see, for example, the wagon, which was, looks really like a 17th century wagon, but the entire background is still the, the, the artificiality of the theater stage. So it doesn't give you like an immersive experience of, uh, of theater, but rather an intellectual experience of theater where you are asking yourself about the content that is being spoken more than the fantastic uh, illusion that is created through theater. Uh, uh, this is something where, where we can talk about this in architectural terms where um, the, this is actually generated using StyleGun 2, uh, where because we can look into the so-called latent space between known data points, that is where, in my opinion, that sort of estrangement happens. Yes, we can recognize these are buildings and these are high-rises, and they're probably based on, on a brutalist data set. And the second one, I mixed up the results from this data set with Picasso paintings. Yeah? Once you know it's Picasso, you start to see it. Yeah? But the idea here is really also to add this element of abstraction into the resulting imagery so that I can then deduct from them, hopefully, an inspiration for further work on it. Yeah? And this idea of estrangement <coughs> is not entirely new. Hegel talked about similar things. Karl Marx talked about estrangement, defamiliarization. I mentioned Viktor Schlowski before and Bert Brecht. So this is what I consider sort of like the, <coughs> the intellectual basis for a lot of the work that we're doing on understanding the theory behind using AI in architecture. And of course, we also have to mention Sigmund Freud in this frame of conversation because he actually wrote uh, a paper called uh, Das Unheimliche, The Uncanny, in where he uh, specifically described the effect uh, of what uncanny can be, which is you see something that is familiar to you, but there's a strange element to it that throws you off the perception of that specific event, person, object, or whatever it is. Um, so I, uh, to, to put it in more contemporary terms, maybe Graham Harmon, I, I'm not the biggest fan of Graham Harmon, but there is one book that I really like, which is called um, uh, uh, Lovecraft and Philosophy. Yeah? And in that book, he describes these estrangement moments in very interesting terms, and also in, funny enough, very uh, architectural terms. Yeah? So you can really take on the idea that, that the estrangement can somehow provoke interest in an architectural project. So this is an example that I'd like to show about that. Every trained architect will recognize in this image certain specific familiar architectural elements, like fenster bender and certain angular shapes and so on, cantilevering elements. So all of these are for you recognizable as something that can be part of a modern building. But when it comes, for example, to how it touches the ground, things start to shift. Like, what is going on there? Is this growing out of the ground? Is this being cut off a, a rock from the ground? So there's like certain things that start to provoke our mind in interrogating what we're seeing in different levels. Same, for example, with the roof line. Is it broken? Is it destroyed? Was it intended that way? Yeah, so there's like this, this whole melange of things that happen that provoke your mind. Attention is one of the most important aspects when it comes to AI, specifically when it is about vision, uh, when it is about uh, visualizations and images. And attention is something that has been explored vastly in neuroscience, which explains how you can create actually a mathematical algorithm out of it that basically can be fed into um, different forms of uh, learning systems or AI systems. This is a statement I make in the book, that what we're seeing currently happening is the first genuinely 21st century design method. So how can I support that claim? Um, I'll put it this way. Certain mathematical ideas, certain algorithms might have been already around in the 20th century, but I think that starting 2014, 2015, with the introduction of the generative adversarial network, style transferring, and other methods that came about at the time, suddenly things shifted to the possible. 
through the application where it became graspable for any form of uh, creative work, yeah? including architecture. But if you think about computational design, and I apologize here for a second for that, for that provocation, is that um, the vast majority of the computational design tools we have been using in the, 20 in the last 22, 23 years already were around in the, in the late 20th century. Yeah? Uh, parametricism, agent-based modeling, uh, polygon modeling, NURBS modeling, all of that already existed at the late in the late 90s. This did not exist yet. This is only possible now because of the technical progress we have made. So that's why I assume that this is the first genuinely 21st design century design method. But as with the arts, I guess that some uh, architecture historian in 50 years' time will figure out whether I'm right or not. We will see. Maybe I'm wrong. Okay. Let me give you a couple of examples about how, how we use it in, in our design studio. So the first one I want to show is the robot garden, uh, which was a collaboration between uh, robotics and architecture. Um, the story behind this is that the robot garden was a commission by the, uh, uh, by the uh, robotics department of the University of Michigan because they were building a new building and they wanted to have a testing ground for their robots just right next to it. And there were some requirements that they were asking it had to fulfill. Oh, but maybe first I should tell that the director of robotics had heard that we were using machine vision and AI to do design in architecture, and that's exactly how these robots also operate. So he was e fascinated by the idea to use the methods that they're using to make the robots recognize the environment to actually generate architecture out of that. And we collaborated here together with Alexandra Carlson, who was a PhD student at the time. She provided, so to speak, the mathematical and the, the programming part of this project, where we used, uh, as <coughs> um, so what it had to fulfill was, different uh, ground conditions, because they want to test the robot in different terrains, rocks, sand, gravel, and so on. And it had to provide uh, steps in various sizes and different, uh, and different forms. Because there is particularly testing here something called the last 100 step problem for robots. And what that means is when you want to have robots delivering goods to your house, yeah, the most complicated part for the robot is the, is, the, is the distance from the delivery van to the door of the house because there's so many changes going on there. There could be steps, no steps. There could be gravel, there could be uh, concrete, there could be you know, earth. There's a variety of different things and they want to test it. So yes, the, the, they're, they're working basically on trying to make delivery with robots here uh, at the University of Michigan. So what we did was we collected a couple of thousand of satellite images with different ground conditions and then we combined different methods in the design here that we had learned to use at the time. So we combined deep dreaming, we combined um, uh, style transferring 2D to 2D, we, we combined uh, style transferring 2D to 3D. So there was a variety of different techniques that came together in, in the design of this. Um, but this was primarily, I would say, the design phase where we used a lot of AI applications to do it. It still needed a lot of manual work to really at the end uh, create the plans and sections and everything. So we're not there yet where we can automatically get that out of, uh, of an AI system, but we're gonna get there um, eventually. I'm pretty sure about that. So um, this was, I mean, I don't know if it's true, but this might be probably one of the first architecture projects that actually literally used AI throughout the design phase. And one thing I, I like to show a lot is this one here. This is actually how the robots perceive the robot garden. Um, this is a LiDAR video uh, of the site. Um, and I was always fascinated about the fact that machines see the world so differently than we do, um, that this kind of psychedelic color fantasies that are pre... Uh, they, of course, they have a reason why they have these colors. There's a logic reason for that, but it's still beautiful in some way, shape or form. Yeah? Uh, it has an own aesthetic yeah, to it. This is just um, a small sample from the data set we used. We used actually at the beginning rather small data sets, to be honest. I mean, the first couple of years we used data sets that were 1,500 images, 2,000 images. This is very small for a proper application, but we also had to learn that. Yeah, so, I mean, our, our colleagues at, at Computer Science said, ah, 1,500, more than enough, yeah. And then when we started really to go deeper into it, we understood that, okay, yes, it, it provides something, but it's not necessarily the most robust result. 
the lower row here is also funny. Um, we use deep dreaming in the lower row here where we trained a model based on images of fountains, steps, and columns because we wanted this, this water feature, these steps on the side, and then tried to deep dream that on renderings of the raw of site and building. And we were wondering why it's always doing these vertical lines here. They're a bit hard to see, but there's some vertical lines coming up there. We didn't understand why it's doing that. And until, until Alexa figured out that in the images that we use for fountains, there's a lot of wa water sprouts. So it thought that's part of the architecture. Yeah. So yeah, this is how this sort of confusing things happen with AI when they don't understand exactly what you're up to. This is one of my favorite results here. It's so weird, it's so strange. Uh, it's a thing how machines think architecture should be. And I really want to build this at some point. Yeah, because anyways, the whole robot garden, by the way, is a funny project because it's actually an architecture piece designed by machines for machines. It's not for human use, actually. Yeah? Something that we've seen that basically exploded last year is text-to-image generators. Every one of you have seen those. Yeah? If it's even already on night late shows, uh, we know that it really has made an impact on, on common culture, so it's really part of mainstream now. Yeah? And he was not the only one. There's like several ones. Um, in the context of language, what I always like to, to, to really uh, stress is this quote here from Wittgenstein, the limits of my language mean the limits of my world. Yeah? Uh, and this is very true for all these text-to-image generators. The, if you are able to really capture a specific essence, uh, essence of a sentence, you will get a good result. I want also to add that uh, Nigoshi Inri, she is one of the developers of Disco Diffusion, which was one of those early uh, image generators. She pointed something out which I think is really important for everyone to understand. If you do not have, here I quote, if you do not have an artistic project, you will never get a good result out of an image generator. So there must be something there already in the first place to get a good result. An early application that where we used image to text, uh, text to image uh, uh, generators is the 24 high school project that we did. This was a competition in Shenzhen in China in 2020. Um, so the only where uh, we used uh, something the called uh, an attentional um, attentional yeah. gun, so an attentional generative yeah, adversary like network, where we used sentences from the from the program asked in the competition and added like a, a small surrealist twist to it. Like for example, um, the gym has 2,000 square meters, two basketball fields, changing rooms, and it's standing on canary yellow legs. Yeah. And then you get this very, very strange, colorful uh, results out of that. It doesn't resemble anything, right? I mean, it doesn't look like it would be generating something that makes some sort of sense, but we still used it. And then used a very primitive method, basically, in Grasshopper to just extract volumes out of the image, yeah? the, which was basically the, the start of the design for this competition. Um, what we learned also in the process was that it cannot create the interior and exterior at the same time. It doesn't have a concept of understanding what's inside and outside. Yeah. Uh, so we just took it as, okay, these are the exterior volumes, and then we totally pragmatically just put the boxes inside there to fill the program. So we, we used it very pragmatically, actually, at the end of the day. Um, it was, a, it was a fun experiment because it also, these sort of experiments, when we, 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 we see like these methods of application and then we very quickly try to put them into an architecture project to test it, to see if it's really applicable for a disciplinary interrogation of a specific program. Yeah? Um, I still consider designing buildings important somehow, yeah? so not to drift away into pure theory, but really take the theory and then crank it into a project. Uh, we made, I think, third place or something, not too bad, uh, but it would have been awesome to build this tool, of course. <coughs> so this was like the first application of a text-to-image generator, which was not a diffusion model. This is a diffusion model. This was the first one that I found, which is Disco Diffusion, was January, like pretty much exactly a year ago. I think a, a lot happened in that year. Um, and I used it to create something like sort of like an endless plan generator out of it. Um, I habitually look into uh, forums and chat groups of media artists because they are the ones who find those things faster than architects. 
But there is something profoundly architectural about image to uh, text to image generators, and I think that's why architects feel so attracted to it. The, the problem of iteration, of iteratively working on a problem. Like a conventional architects, or every, most architects I would argue, they take a piece of paper, they take a pen and start to work on a plan, right? Make a sketch and then another one and then another one and then iteratively work on that until it satisfies with the result. This is an example of it, this is not drawings, but this is uh, 28 models from the Atelier Hans Hollein from 2004 where the same iterative working through the problem is, de is demonstrated in models, you know, mass models, yeah? more mass models, more mass models to find the right solution for that building. This was basically, this was actually for the Saturn Tower in Vienna. I think that like the, the second from below there, or second from up, that's the one they I think built at the end. But I think that's what, what attracts architects so much to this technique, because what it does is it, it amplifies that. Yeah? So I did a little bit of math and I should actually uh, revisit this, this, this calculation because it's, it's long ago. From April last year until uh, September last year, I generated 74,000 images in mid-journey. Yeah, 74,000. And I'm not a power user. There's people who do much more than those. Yeah? But you see that this idea of really iteratively working through the problem, you get four, you get four results, you select one, you work on further on that, or you, you rerun it and so on. So this iteratively working on the thing is, is something that feels, I think, very attractive for architects. Uh, just mentioning a couple of diffusion models. I mentioned already disco diffusion, mid-journey. I guess every one of you has heard about that. DALI 2. In the meantime, there's even more. Um, yeah, stable diffusion, for example, would be one. But how do they work? Like, why do they do what they do? Um, around 2015, there were enough annotated images in data sets uh, that would recognize particular elements of an image. That's what you need to have safe automated cars. They need to recognize who's a pedestrian, uh, what's another car, what's the sidewalk, and so on. And somebody came up with the idea, wait a second, if, if we have so many annotations, maybe we can do the following. Maybe we can actually train a machine to create a caption for that image. So when it sees this here, it would say, people walking on a bridge. So you can do a sentence. And this was used, of course, to automatically capture images for automated book productions, magazines, and so on. They're all using that now. That was 2015. And then somebody came up with an idea. What happens if I turn it around? Like, what happens if I input a sentence and let the machine generate an image based on that? Yeah. Um, by the way, this is a common topic in, in computer science when it comes to AI applications, the idea to maybe take an idea and and turn it upside down and see what happens. They do this all the time. A deep dreaming, for example, works like that. Um, and this was Elman Mansinov and his colleagues at the Amazon Web Services. And they immediately, of course, also created uh, or did a paper called Generating Images from Captions with Attention. And again, here's the term attention I mentioned before, very important. And these were the first results they generated. And these are uh, in their paper that they published 2016. Um, a stop sign is flying in blue skies, a herd of elephants flying in the blue skies, a toilet seat sits open in the grass field. If you squint your eyes, you might be able to recognize that. But you see that the resolution was really bad at the time. This was a common problem in 15, 16, 17, that the image resolution for almost all of these results was 72 by 72 pixels. That has to do with the, with the heavy computational load that comes up when you increase the, the number of pixels, because if you think in neural network terms, every pixel is a neuron. Yeah? So if you increase the number of resolution, you have, to have, you, you have just much more neurons that you have to calculate. That's why it becomes heavier. So diffusion mo model does the following. It takes an image and it adds noise to it until it's only noise. Yeah? And then along a Markov chain, it can basically reverse the process and organize the pixels according to your sentence or to your prompt. Yeah? So it takes the noise and then denoises, denoises, denoises until it has an image. This is maybe a little bit more comprehensive. You see the data in this case is, for example, this, this uh, Corbusier house, uh, Villa Savoie, and this is a stand-in for millions of images. Yeah? And then it adds the noise, adds noise, and then it generates samples by denoising, yeah? and then it, out of the denoising, it can create data. And 
I guess you have heard about uh, uh, curve fitting. Curve fitting is a problem in AI. I'm not going to go deeply into that, but it 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 goes uh, it cr it repeats the process often enough to have a um, robust curve fitting for what you are asking for to generate. Diffusion models are they really com combine a lot of different uh, aspects at the moment. Yeah? So you have, first of all, you have the algorithms uh, about efficient sampling, improved likelihood, data with spatial structures. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. It's a bit too, too much here. Uh, but also, of course, it, it connects to other generative models, variational autoencoders, gen uh, GANs, normalizing flows. Variational autoencoders, for example, are very popular when it is about making music, because the, you can basically use MIDI data in those uh, encoders. And then the applications that you can have, on which reach from machine vision to natural language processing, et cetera, et cetera. This, is a, this, is, this whole diagram is a lecture on its own, so I'm going to just jump over it. Uh, let me go into what it means for architects. What happens if you prompt Midjourney to create a Mies van der Rohe building? And that's exactly the prompt I used. So it can really provide quite precise imagery that depicts a Mies van der Rohe building. Why I'm showing you this? I'm showing you this because I'm completely convinced that this is a great tool for really lazy architects. Yeah? So you can prompt things that exist, and it will create iterations of it very convincingly. So if a, if a client comes to you, can you do a Miss on the Road building? Give me, give me five minutes. Give me five minutes. No problem. Yeah? So this is going to happen. It's already happening, by the way. Yeah, I've, been, I've been seeing on, on Instagram streams people literally doing Miss on the Road building. So I was like, okay, yeah. That was predictable. <coughs> also, the changes between different uh, versions of these uh, diffusion tools is absolutely incredible. Section drawing through an opera house. This is a mid journey version two from May this year. Okay, this is not a real opera house section, right? It doesn't work as an opera house. I I'm not pretending that it does. Yeah? But what it can do is inspire you when you have a competition, for example, it provides you with a starting point, maybe. Something that you can take and iterate on and work on until it becomes part of your, of your project. I think these sort of collaborations between what machine learning can do, what uh, uh, learning systems can do, what AI can do, and what the human mind can do with it is where it becomes quite exciting. This is version 4 now, a couple of weeks old. This is already overfitting, in my opinion. It's already doing something that it's like the romanticized idea of what an opera would be. So the other one was weird, strange, uh, a little bizarre. This one is just the Walt Disney version of an opera, which is kind of disappointing. The most beautiful house in the world. What do you think AI thinks is the most beautiful house in the world? Version 2. Okay, all right. Now the same prompt with the newest version of Midjourney. Do you think it's going to be better? Well, let's check it out. That's the most beautiful house in the world. Okay, yes, not really fair, beautiful, and so on. You can, it's a stretchable term, right? But one thing I can tell you, if I see these images, I'm not worried about architects. Early on, with the er earliest version of Midjourney, I did like this whole series of really strange things like Le Corbusier house made of Kobe beef, a house made of feathers, or a hairy villa. Yeah, so these are things that are really fun to explore and, and, and look how can you combine these really strange concepts with each other to create something that is provocative. And that's one of the biggest takeaways for me from this whole diffusion discussion currently, is that the, the term provocation. I think that if your mind gets provoked to do something interesting, strange, different, innovative, fantastic, um, hopefully at some point you will be able to take these inspirations and cast them into something that becomes built reality. Yeah? I'm not saying we have to build buildings of Kobe beef, but uh, 
you get the idea. Like for example, these things, um, um, facade studies, they became completely, uh, they were everywhere at some point. Like everyone was doing facade studies in, in Mid Journey because it's easy to do and it's fast and you can have these iterations and changes that at some point might really inform your designs. Like, wait, I had this image that I generated like two months ago, maybe I can use. Yeah. And I did tons of uh, Alpine villa studies. I don't know why I'm so obsessed with making a, an, an, a villa in the Alps, but somehow it's, it's ingrained in me. I always go back to that thing. No, but I think it also has to do with the idea of repeating the experiment over and over again. So it has this sort of scientific element to it where you're repeating the experiment that you did before to see if the changes in the algorithm that they've implemented changes a lot of the design or not. And it does, which is quite fascinating. Because they, they're becoming more and more realistic. I mean, this facade here, for example, with some imagination and manual work, you can build this. I mean, you're the building experts more than I am, but uh, I, I think this is not a big deal to do that. CNC, I always wanted to CNC mill stone. I think that's kind of cool. Okay, we saw this already. They're also be becoming increasingly better in, in creating sections. Like, remember this opera section? Like the, the way how they're now really getting into a point where at first glance they're completely convincing. Only when you start to really interrogate the program, the way how you move through the building, you start to figure out that it does not really work. But more and more I get attracted to this and take that as a starting point for further exploration in a project. And ex projects like this one, the Generally Center in Vienna, this is a, a project we did last year. Um, does the video start? No, wait. There we are. So generally center is basically a combination between office building and shopping mall. Yeah, it's in the 6th district, in on the border to the 7th district in Vienna, at the marie uh, There is already an existing building there called the generally center, but there has been ideas of replacing it and discussions about replace, replacing it. So basically, as, as you saw this imagery at the very beginning with this brutalist data set, this was also done or used for this project. Uh, where we used StyleGun2 to create a latent walk. And I mentioned before, for me, the interesting thing is that, so this is the data set where we scraped images from uh, the internet uh, for um, brutalist buildings. And then we trained it. So it, it takes the training takes from a couple of hours to weeks or months if you want to. And then out of the latent walk, which is what you're just going to see here, we selected a set of images where we thought, okay, this is interesting, this could be fitting on the side, or it's just architecturally interesting for us. We took some of the images and then used uh, a method called pixel projection to reconstruct the 3D model out of this. This is like the biggest criticism I can do on me joining the things. They're of course only pixels, they're only 2D. Yeah? So we took three images, a plan and two sections, and two views actually rather, elevations and then mesh them together to create this 3D model out of it. So basically the projection allows you wherever pixels are intersecting, it will create mass. Yeah. And then we continue working with this model. Um, same thing as before, uh, not as, as, as uh, intensive, like for example, as in the school that I showed you. There was less work to be done in this model than we did in the school model because, funny enough, th it started to give us things that were usable for us as interior parts of the interior. But we still had to add floors, walls, uh, staircases, elevators, like all these sort of really functional parts had to be added manually in order to make it a functional working building. But in doing so, because we were working within that model that we got out of the process, it was re really interesting to see like, okay, I can actually jump with the stair here and then over here. So it starts to really to communicate a lot with what we got as a result from the process using um, the StyleGun2. These are all the things, the pieces we had to add to it, which is folded out in the model. So here you see it again. Like all that you see that we basically pulled out of the building, these are all the elements that we had to add manually. And then the most recent project that we, we did in a similar technique is called the Deep House. Um, this, is a, this is, in fact, a villa in the Alps. Uh, it was commissioned by an Austrian uh, neurologist who had heard that we're using methods that basically derive from his expertise because neurological science is the basis for every AI application and was fascinated by the idea to use that to build a house for him. 
So, the, he, but he had one condition. The condition was it has to be a mid-century modern house. Okay, good. So, we created a, a data set of mid-century modern facades and, and plans. These are already the results here from uh, from the um, uh, from the Latin book. So partially also quite wild solutions, didn't work that well. This is the training. Th it is really funny. The, our computer science colleagues told us that if you want to increase a data set, we also can take the same images and just put them upside down. That allows us to increase it by double the number. Yeah? But we thought like, okay, maybe computer scientists don't know gra uh, gravity because for architects, if the thing is upside down, it doesn't work so well. We used it anyways. And, uh, and then we did the same method as before. So we did uh, the pixel projection that creates the model here. But the most interesting result for us in this project was that it also delivered to us the entire interior. Yeah? Without we, we didn't really search for that or we didn't anticipate. It just happened. Yeah? It was like, awesome. We can use that. Yeah? So this is the site with the house on top of it. Everything you see here was already provided by the result of the model. So the, the really beautiful ceiling, how it came out like this. These blocks in the corners that provide us things like kitchen or private spaces. Yeah. This is a sleeping room. And the funny thing for me is that uh, although the basis is really a mid-century modern data set with existing buildings, things emerge in this model that a mid-century architect would never do because they are not really super functional, right? For example, this kind of weird wall that is separating interior and exterior with this very um, uh, porous and, and, and broken quality, yeah? Um, the, the whole work on, on neural architecture and AI ideas and so on is also accompanied by a set of uh, activities. Yeah? So it's not only the, pr the products we do, there's like a whole set of people around now that are doing similar or, or really interesting work. So one of the things we did was the neural architecture exhibition, which basically just ended a, couple of a week ago or so something. It opened last year in um, October. Um, with people like uh, Daniel Polohan, Emmanuel Co, AI, AI Africa, Ryan Vincent Manning, Rara Naisaitite, Corey Peak, Daniel Köhler, Kyle Steinfeld. So this whole group of people inter interesting in similar topics to what I presented to you today is increasing and growing. Um, and we also made, um, the, day the day after the opening, we made a symposium at Taubman College where all these people came together and discussed a variety of the issues that I showed you also today, uh, but also more about their own work and the way they, uh, they are approached to, to working with AI. Because I think also we're so early in, in this whole process that there's still a lot of room to grow, a lot of room to <coughs> discuss ideas. They can go from the wicked to the tamed problem. So they can be cultural, but they also can be purely pragmatical, yeah, if you want. That's what I, what I, why I'm so interested in AI is also because it's a field of interrogation that is so embedded in the entire society of, of humans, it's not just contained in architecture. Yeah? There's, there's another stylistic name somebody used a couple of years ago and wanted to impose on to anyone. I'm not going to say who said that. Yeah? But that terminology, that idea was purely stylistic, in my opinion. Yeah? And it was very, uh, egal um, uh, very elite thinking, very uh, exclusive. Yeah? This is a far more inclusive approach to architecture because it touches on every single aspect of humanity. Yeah? AI, in the meantime, every one of you is surrounded by AI today already, even without noticing. Yeah? Every time you open your phone, you are talking to an AI, basically. You're playing with an AI. Every time you, you use a filter on Instagram, it's an AI doing that for you. When you get recommendations on Amazon for books, that's an AI doing that for you. Yeah? When you try to get a bank loan, an AI is probably going to decide whether you get it or not. Yeah? So it's already all around us. It's only logic that architecture also engages with this. And I want to mention one sentence I always say in my lectures is, if we as architects do not engage with it, somebody else will do it for us. And then we have no say in it, yeah? which might be the worst for architecture. But as you see in this lecture, it's, gr it's growing. More people are coming into this idea. We created a, a, a website, for example, aiarchitects.org where we collect different positions, different people working on it. We're adding more and more people to this uh, continuously. Um, the laboratory, which was founded two years ago, exactly two years ago, 
uh, thanks to Taubman College and their generosity to allow to do this. Uh, it's, it's gaining momentum, we are getting more research done. The lab also actually talks a lot about practical applications for AI. So for example, we are doing large scale data sets of plans and 3D models of architecture because they are not out there. Architecture is very data poor, as funny as it sounds. Yeah? We do not have the large scale data sets that are well informed and well done to create robust results. Yeah? So this is work that has been ongoing now for years. If you want to s visit the website, ar2il.com, we need to update it. Haven't done it in a while. And then there is uh, there's the YouTube channel, Remeshing-AI, where most of the lectures that I hold are collected, but there's also tutorials of how to use Python coding, scripting, uh, in a variety of uh, neural networks. It's I have to admit, this development is so fast that those videos are already outdated, I think. So we have to probably do, that ag do them again. Uh, I don't know if you're going to share this video with me, but if you do, I'm going to certainly post it too. And this is the this is what it was about today. Yeah, neural architecture design. A shameless plug, of course. Yeah. And then there's also machine hallucinations, which I had the pleasure to um, co-edit with uh, Neil Leach. Similar topic. A new one is coming up next year. And this one should be out sooner than later with Springer: Architecture in the Age of Intelligent Machines. The if the neural architecture book covers the theoretical discursive part of AI and architecture, this one is the technical manual that actually describes like the math behind it and like with code examples and so on and so on. Maybe that's why it's taking a bit longer to finish it. It's just a little bit more cumbersome to do. Thank you very much. Open for questions. Thank you.